Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm pleased to, to welcome you to today's panel on diversity in Hollywood, specifically Latina women writers in mainstream American television. This program is in conjunction with our current exhibition of feminist Latina artists called Radical Women, Latin American Artists 1960 to 1985. The show opened in September, and there's been an absolutely extraordinary response, both in the press and from visitors to the museum. And I hope that if you haven't seen it yet, you'll come back to the museum and check it out. We're open every day except Mondays, and museum admission is free. We also have a ton of public programs related to the exhibition throughout the fall, including a screening of a new documentary about the iconoclastic singer Chavela Vargas on November 28th, and a live performance by Mexican cabaret singer Astrid Haddad on November 30th. Also, every Thursday, we've invited artists and scholars to do a special kind of exhibition walkthrough of a very personal and subjective nature. Um, well, they're mostly on Thursdays, except for this coming Tuesday, we have one with the artist Nicole Hebron. And after that, we have um, Artemisa Clark, Maricela Norte, Sandra de la Losa, and Raquel Gutierrez. And the whole list of artists and scholars is available on our website or in the Hammer calendar. If you'd like to receive reminder emails about these and our other programs, you can sign up for to be on our email list. There's iPads in the lobby. Um, and so now on to today's program. The Latina presence on American television has increased in recent years with lots of new TV shows that have created dynamic and innovative roles for Latina actresses. We're calling this program Escenas Latinas, Changing the Narrative, to highlight the importance of bringing new narratives about women of color to the screen. Specifically, we're hoping to emphasize that for real diversity to have a chance in mainstream media, and for TV and movies ever to have a hope of representing the real America we live in, we need diversity not only in front of the camera, but behind the scenes as well, and especially in the writer's room. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our moderator today is Professor Bambi Haggins of the UC Irvine Department of Film and Media Studies. Her work explores race, class, gender, and sexuality in American film and television with a focus on comedy. Her first book, Laughing Mad, The Black Comic Persona in Post-Soul America, received the Kovacs Award for Outstanding Scholarship in Cinema and Media Studies. She was also a writer for the documentary film Why We Laugh, Funny Women, which is an uncensored look into the lives of female stand-up comedians. And she was featured in the HBO documentary Whoopi Goldberg Presents Moms Mabley. Her current book project, Black Laughter Matters, explores blackness and comedy in the age of Obama and beyond. Vivian Mejia is a television writer, columnist, and published author. Born in New York to Colombian immigrant parents, she's written for a wide variety of television shows such as Just Shoot Me, Ugly Betty, Eve, and most recently, East Los High. More recently, she adapted journalist Helen Thorpe's nonfiction book, Just Like Us, The True Story of Four Mexican Girls Coming of Age in America, and she's adapted it into a one-hour drama pilot. She's also written and edited for several magazines, including Elle, Self, Latina, Variety, and Detour. Gloria calderon Kellett is the executive producer and co-showrunner of One Day at a Time, currently streaming on Netflix. Before that, she wrote and produced on CW's iZombie, ABC's Mixology, Lifetime's Devious Maids, and the CBS sitcom's Rules of Engagement and How I Met Your Mother, for which she won, for which she won an Alma Award for Outstanding Script. Gloria graduated from Loyola Marymount University, and her very first play, Plain Strangers, garnered her a Kennedy Center Award and went on to win the Del Rey Players Playwriting Award and the LMU Playwright of the Year Award. She has a master's degree in theater from University of London, and her plays have been published in a book called Accessories. She's a founding member of the sketch comedy group And Donkey Makes Five, and she's written and performed stand-up comedy at the Improv and the Comedy Store. As an actress, she's appeared on stage in London, Madrid, New York, and all over Los Angeles. Her TV acting credits include How I Met Your Mother, Angie Tribeca, and Trophy Wife, but her proudest on-camera moment thus far was appearing as a narrator on Drunk History New Orleans. <laughs> Carolina Rivera wrote her first feature screenplay in 1991 called Cilantro y Perejil, which garnered three Ariel Awards, which is the Mexican version of the Oscars, um, for Best Original Screenplay, Best Story, and Best Original Song. Since then, she's written more than 15 feature films, four of which have been blockbusters in Mexico, and two of her films have won awards at international film festivals. 
in TV. She's written TV series that have broken Mexican TV ratings records. She's the original creator of the Mexican format for Devious Maids, which was adapted by Mark Cherry for American audiences. She's written four telenovelas in Mexico, including Amor Cautivo, which recently aired on Telemundo, and she's currently writing for the award-winning, wonderful TV show, Jane the Virgin. So now please join me in welcoming Bambi Haggis, Vivian Mejia, Gloria calderon Kellett, and Carolina Rivera. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, I feel like it is an incredible birthday present for me to have the Happy opportunity birthday. to talk to all these wonderful women. Um, I was so excited when I was asked to do this because I think it's so important for us to hear the voices of women who are in the writer's room, women who are showrunners, women, women who've been in front of the camera and behind the camera. Because obviously uh, we see the Latina presence becoming stronger and stronger over the course of even the past five years. Um, one of the things that I thought was uh, was extremely interesting, I was looking at uh, Latina Magazine back in 2012, and they had a list of all of the, um, yeah, this is why I don't use paper a lot. <laughs> um, they had a list of the 20 most iconic um, characters, um, Latina t characters back in 2012, and, um, and only half of them uh, were women. Um, in uh, uh, Gabrielle from um, Desperate Housewives, of course, Betty from Ugly Betty, mm -hmm. uh, Rosario on Will and Grace, okay. oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sister Peter Marie on Oz, God, I love that show, um, Lieutenant LaGuerta on Dexter, uh, Judy Reyes, who uh, we'll talk about later, uh, on, on Scrubs. And today, what's so interesting to me is the different kind of presentation. And this was back in 2014. Uh, April Ludgate on Parks and Re Recreation, April Pla uh, Aubrey Plaza, Mariana Foster on The Fosters, uh, Santana Lopez on Glee, um, Callie Th uh, Torres on Grey's Anatomy, uh, Detectives um, Rosa Diaz and Emmy Santiago on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Nine -Nine. Um, and, and what was so interesting to me is when they had the, f before women were only half, and now women were the majority. Uh, Latinas were the majority on this list uh, only two years ago, and that doesn't even mention the glorious Jane. Uh, on Jane the Virgin. A and so one of the things that, that I thought would be um, sort of useful is to put very, very, very briefly, because you don't want to hear me talk, um, <laughs> talk about sort of the context for uh, Latina representation. And um, in, in many of the same ways that uh, his film historian Dal Dal Bogle talked about African-American stereotypes, um, the Toms, Coons, Mulattoes, Mammies, and, and Bucks. Um, historian and theorist Charles Ramirez Berg talked about uh, the different sets of male and female stereotypes for Latina characters in film. Um, the bandito and the harlot, the male buffoon and the female clown, the Latin lover and the dark lady. And what is interesting to me is how um, I think 15 years ago those tropes were still very easily seen in representations of both black folks and Latinos and Latinas. Um, and everything's more complicated now. And the reason it's more complicated now is because of women like these 
who are writing these characters, who are creating characters that are uh, characters that feel real, that resonate to multiple audiences within and outside of um, the Latino community, Latinx community. And um, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to sort of hear from them about um, where they feel that everything, it, where things are going and what they would like to see happen um, in the future on, on media. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have too many papers and, <laughs> um, and I just summarized everything and now I can't find my questions. <laughs> um, forgive me, I'm getting old. Um, and, and that's what, what I'd first like to talk about is just sort of that, those lists that I just talked about um, in terms of sort of the impact of platform, of network, and of genre in terms of the representation of Latinas in, in both the things you've worked on and, and also um, things that you would like to see in the future. Sure. Well, we were just talking about this in the green room um, that, yeah, I do see progress. And I think that that's the thing we need to focus on, that there has been progress. And um, I, I certainly have seen a huge shift in, I would say, the last 10 years, although we still struggle with um, you know, I, I, I could say even with like Devious Maids, I, I don't know if you remember, because um, it's a small town and when there's a, you know, a show with Latinas in it, it's like they're, they're like, okay, round up the usual suspects yes. and every <laughs> Latina writer in town goes out for the job, right? Yes, that's right. And, um, you know, I know people struggled with like, okay, well, this is a job opportunity, but here we are again, we're going to be writing about yes, leads, but they're going to be cleaning ladies, and it, how is that perpetuating that kind of stereotype? And, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's like a, a push-pull that we're kind of moving along on. But, yeah, I, moving forward, I would love to see um, different genres, different types of characters. Um, I was telling a woman the other day that my mom raised my brother and I, she was a single mom, and uh, she raised us working as a systems, an as a computer programmer and then a systems analyst in the 70s and 80s in Miami. So they were saying, well, how does that fit into a Latino story, you know? And so <laughs> it's about kind of breaking through the, the general ideas that people have and um, exploring kind of the humanity within all of us that goes past these particular ideas that people have of, about what Latino, being Latino means. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's an education that needs to happen. But um, I think we're getting there. I mean, I, I don't know. What do you guys think? It is think? getting better. It's definitely getting better, but we still have a long way to go. Right. And I think, I think that, <laughs> but, I, I, but what's crazy is that not really till I got to Hollywood did I think in terms of Latino stories, because I would watch television and I would just put myself in the characters. It didn't really occur to me how starved I was for representation until I, until I started to see it. And then you go, oh my God, they, had, they, they spoke Spanish or they said something like my family, because we're so starved. I think we are so and starved. So conditioned. And so conditioned. And I don't wake up in the morning and go, another day in the life of a Latina. Let's, you know, you, yeah. <laughs> you just live your life and go about your day and you're just a person that cares about That's your right. kids. And you're so, it's mind blowing to me that, that, it's, that people have such a framework for who we are in this town. It it's blows my mind. And so the fact that we have to go to these places and be the one person in the room that speaks up, that's where the change is happening. I think that like the fact that there are three women on this panel is incredible in a very male dominated. Uh, We're radical just being here. It's true. <laughs> that's yeah, right. That's true. true. Um, I, I hear all the stories and of course my, my personal story is very different. Uh, I just got uh, here uh, to LA and to the US only four years ago and I was approached by uh, the showrunner in Jane the Virgin um, 
because, of course, I was writing telenovelas in Mexico. I was show running them. And, um, and yeah, I was a token Latina who wrote telenovelas <laughs> to write uh, Jane the Virgin, who's based in a Venezuelan telenovela. And, of course, uh, in Mexico, I was also, we were exposed to American content because we, you know, we, we, we see all these shows and that travel to Mexico and, and we are very much exposed to American television. And, and I always um, thought about these things in my country, which is in amazing, no? Yeah. Why, why, do, why do we don't see Latinos in the shows that travel right. to Mexico? And uh, of course, Everyone in Mexico has someone living in the U.S., uh, some pariente who, you know, yeah. who either crossed or just came or whatever, yeah. you know. And, uh, and we are very much connected to the Latino communities here. And, and it, 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 it always has surprised me um, that, no, like the, the representation and also, as you were saying, you were... Um, talking about devious mates and how it's of course uh you know it's the mates that are latinas and i'm i'm like i remember i uh i you know i thinking or uh, about um why not uh latinos in 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 positions of power say for example right. you know a story about a woman president a latina right. Right. Woman president or an in the U.S. Or, or, yeah, or an right. entrepreneur, or how do you say, like a yes. yeah. someone in computers, you know, yeah. not. Well, and I think like you know, dog. I think the thing about Devious Maids, yeah. I think that we'll know we've done it right when you can do a show about like Latina bisexual murderers. <laughs> then it's like we've done That's it because there will have been so many. Like yeah. Devious Maids, it was one of the first, and so to have one of the first that had five female leads that were Latina to be maids, everyone was like, yay! But oh. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, yeah. it just it was, was too just... layered. It was too layered. And so yes. we will get to the point where hopefully we'll be able to do those. But, yes, we need. We just need more. We just need more. I mean, there was just a study this week done by uh, Deadline uh, printed a thing about half of the immigrants, half of the Latino immigrants on television are criminals. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Half. Or, or negative. Negative. Like, negative. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know anybody in a gang, y'all. I don't know anybody <laughs> in a gang. All the immigrants I know are the hardest working people I've ever met. Yeah. So where are those stories? So let's tell those stories. Let's tell yeah. those stories because sadly we are living in a time where people are using television for their news and their media and so that has an impact. Kids see that and that has an impact on how they feel about everyone. I mean, my gosh, we haven't even talked about Muslims. We haven't even talked about Asian Americans, yeah. Indian Americans, Muslim. I mean, they are wildly un unrepresented. And it is impactful what we're doing in a way that at initially I think that we all went into this to be storytellers, mm -hmm. but then you get into it and you're on this side and you realize when people are coming up to you and weeping and hugging you and saying, thank you so much for letting me see myself on TV. Thank you. I mean, it's a different thing. It's a different thing. It affects you in a way that I can't, I can't go back. Yeah. I can't go back after experiencing that. And well, seeing how much it means to people. I think when you say, you know, there, a, a lot of other ethnicities are underrepresented, but really when you look at population, even just um, Mexican or Mexican-American people of Mexican descent, we're talking like 13 million, something like that. I mean, I was doing research when I was doing this last pilot. And in addition to other Latino cultures that are living here in the U.S., it, it's growing. I mean, there will come a time, I think fairly soon, yeah. where we will be like, 40% of the population. So when you look at that and you see how little we see ourselves on screen right now, then you, you realize like, wow, what a disconnect, yes. you know? That, that is remarkable that that's, that, 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 that's, that's how racial, many people yeah. we are, you know? So I think that that's one of the reasons why we're, we're up here, you know, we're, we're yeah, Los Angeles is the second largest uh, Mexican city. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> larger, yeah, after Mexico City. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. the second largest, and then it's Guadalajara and Monterrey right. and all those yeah. cities. But yeah, we are underrepresented in the media, and that is something that needs to change. Also because being all seen as the same, too. 
Because you got a you got a Mexican, that. a Colombian, and a Cuban up here. Of course. So it's like there's all, but it's <laughs> yeah, but we no, are. But, but, but they course. see us as one thing. That's right. Of course. As well, and so yeah. the differentiation of the storytelling and how we try to tell those stories also can be, I think, really impactful and helpful. Yeah. Well, and that goes on to and something we were see. talking about um, back backstage: the idea that um, you have these different shows that are set in spaces that have uh, large Latina populations. And, um, but it's not necessarily the Latina population that is most known for that area. Right. Um, you have it with Ugly Betty, they're Mexican American. With um, Jane the Virgin, they're Venezuelan. Venezuelan. Okay. Um, and with um, One Day at a Time, they're Cuban in Echo Park. Now, even though historically we can look at all of these spaces and say, you know, in the 1960s, there was a large influx of the Cuban population in to Echo Park, Echo Park mm -hmm. because they were literally being um, helped by the government to relocate. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can also look at the fact that in Queens, since 2004, uh, the Mexican population is growing the most of any other group uh -huh. besides Dominicans, um, who you often don't see. That's, right, that's right. Afro-Cuban. I mean, that's right. Afro-Latino. Afro -Latino, and, yeah. and that's not a population you see on television. At um, all. Yeah, that's very helpful. And, and so... I guess what I'm what I'm asking is we were talking about this idea of this sort of not just cross cultural casting but also framing these stories in in ways that that are focusing on um, on different um, different areas of a be of Latina yeah. you know yeah. it, it, it's not um, mm -hmm. it's not that it's not speaking to an experience, but you know, the first time I saw Ugly Betty, for example, um, I was thinking, uh, you know, I thought, why isn't she Puerto Rican? Right. <laughs> you know, it, it was just- Or Colombian. Or Colombian. Because the original- was New York. Oh, was, yeah, the original telenovela. Yeah. Was, Colombia. Yeah. And, and, oh, was and, yeah. yeah, learning something too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was uh, remade in Mexico. Also, yeah, so. oh, that's Yo right. soy yeah. Betty that's, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. Um, no, but you know what I think is the most important thing uh, that we're talking about right now is authenticity. And so yeah. um, I worked on Ugly Betty, and I, you know, I, I can honestly say I don't know how the decision was made to make the family Mexican. I think they decided because it was the largest Latino demographic that they were going to go with that versus what would have been really kind of natural coming out of Queens in New York in at the time, which was the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. With um, so that's a, a sp that was decided by, you know, the by network. the network by yes. people that were not Latino. Right. Um, with um, one day at a time, th this story it, like just touches my heart so deeply because it's so gratifying to see glorious story. So Norman Lear had the respect and the integrity to, to ask Gloria, like, well, what's your story? Well, you know, there weren't a lot of Cubans in South, Southern California. That is not typical. But Gloria was here, and she had a really, truly rich, authentic story. Mm -hmm. And so he went with that. He didn't say, oh, well, no, there's only Mexicans in L.A. You have to make it yeah. Mexican. But the network did call and asked me to make the Mexican. Oh, really? Oh, they did, oh. yeah, yeah. And I That's said, you know, I would, I would love to write the Mexican experience because I grew up in San Diego, so I know I have many close friends that are Mexican, and I love that experience. But I had so many specific stories stories about my Cuban parents who are right here. Oh. Uh, they're everywhere, guys. Porque so, somos Latino. So they come with me everywhere. My dad drove me. He yeah, hates when I Uber. When, yeah. when I Uber, he's like, I'm the they're Uber, okay? All the families. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I wanted to tell stories that I hadn't seen. I'd never seen Pedro Pan. I'd never seen Talking About the Shea Shirt. I've never seen uh, the, the immigration experience by people who, you know, Cubans were allowed to come here and the government helped them out. And as a result, this is what can happen in one generation. And so it, I felt like it was important. 
to to talk about that, to talk about how different people are treated differently, and we do a show about immigration yeah. um, as told through that through that lens, and that was important for but, me but to talk Norman about. Norman took that chance, he right? Did. Like yeah. he, he did. said, he did. your your point of view is yes. valid. Yes. You know, he validated yes. that yeah. we have actually something to say yes. that might be informative. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, in the so. case, yeah, in the case of Jane, the decision to make the family Venezuelan was a showrunner. Jenny Ehrman, and she wanted to respect like the original format, which is a Venezuelan uh, family, and that's a Venezuelan telenovela, which is uh, what she was intending to. But I was I was telling Gloria and uh, Vivian that um, in the green room and Bambi <laughs> that uh, this is just an anecdote, but uh, they wanted the the uh, character played by Jaime Camille to be a Venezuelan. Um, uh, telenovela star, and Jaime was a little bit like, "Hey, wait, but um, I'm a Mexican telenovela star, actually, right? Because I'm famous, very famous." Very famous. <laughs> and he's like, "I can't do Venezuelan accent. Is it okay if I'm a Mexican telenovela star?" And 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 yeah, I mean, Jenny was open to it, and she said, "Yes, of course. I mean, if yeah." And we we had a talk about how uh, Mexican telenovelas are like, you know travel all over the world and you know and that Jaime is a telenovela star and 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 that became a whole thing in the room in those in that first season because then it was like hey there was a whole process where okay what's the difference between a Mexican and a Venezuelan right what in terms of everything it's like what do they eat how do they speak what do they say what you know like mm -hmm. uh all sorts of uh, things that were like very interesting to 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 the rest of the writers because I was the only Latina in the room <laughs> at the time, mm -hmm. no, in uh, writing about this uh, American um, Latino family and and when the show is thirty percent Spanish also, so wow. yeah, and um, but it was very interesting to see, you no, know, to yeah. see. These discussions, and I think it, it's important to have these discussions. Also, as you say, they see us like a bunch, no? Like yeah, we're, we're all different. the same, but we're not. We have like yes. our own the little stories are different stories. Of course, yes. you know, the stories of our countries are different. Yes. The things that that bring us here are different. different. You know, and also how much how, what this country, how this country changes us. Sure. So you know, we're someone who's a Mexican American second, third generation who might not even speak Spanish right. can still identify as having a Latino um, ethnicity, but not be able to communicate with someone who's from Mexico or, you know, so it, th something changes and that's what's so wonderful. That's, that's the uh, fun part, you know, it's like the American part that I think people would love to see, you know, uh, represented on screen. No, and, and one of the, the things that's so fascinating about hearing all of you talk is about trying to find ways within a system where they do see the Latino block, mm -hmm. how to make it authentic, how to, how to feed in cultural specificity. And, you know, in the case uh, of, of One Day at a Time, it, it's the, you know I, I actually actually did research for this um, <laughs> and was looking up about uh, about the, the the Cuban enclave in Echo Park mm -hmm. during the 1960s and I grew up here I didn't know that um, and, and so there's, I, a, there's a statue of Jose Marti in Echo Park in sure. actual Echo Park <laughs> and, and and so I guess how do you as it, and that also, it also depends on the role you're playing, mm -hmm. whether you're the only one on a, staff, a writing staff, whether you're, um, you know, whether you have more control over who's in the writing room or whether you're the showrunner. You know, how do you try to negotiate more and more specificity in a room where people don't necessarily know the difference? That's that's why I think we have to be our own bosses. That that's yeah. where it's all going for all of us. Yeah, it was it, it was very interesting also because uh, there's a whole part of, of of the show in Jane where 
I mean, it takes place in a telenovela set, right? And um, of course, there's uh, telenovelas that are made in the U.S., in Telemundo, in Univision, they all produce telenovelas, but then there was this whole thing about, okay, um, let's let's do that. Let, everybody, there was talk about, uh, oh, let's do a second season of a telenovela, and I'm like, no, telenovelas don't have seasons. It's like yeah. they start, it's 120 hours, and they all end up in marriages, and, and uh -huh. like, oh, oh, wow, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole, it's been like, a, I mean, for me, it's been like a journey, you know, like, a, like, like, I feel like I have a voice and, and, you know, because it's, it's so strange in a way that for me it was surprising because there's, it's not that, like, there's no Mexicans in LA and like, yeah. there's no, you know, like, that people don't watch telenovelas in LA, right, and right. you know, for me, it was like a, a very surprising thing to to realize, no. And but we are yeah. often. I mean, I would say until this, until one day at a time, I was the only Latina in the room. Oh no, Tanya Saracho, Tanya and I, and Tanya, uh -huh. Tanya, thank God for Tanya, who has anyway, her own show, who's now a showrunner yeah, doing her own that's show. Right. Oh. Uh, but that was it. So it's funny when I wanted to staff this show. This is the first show I got to staff. And I said, we got to have at least half Latino in there and half women. And I wanted the conversation. So I did want some guys and some white guys and some, I, I wanted the mix because I want, for a few reasons, I wanted to be able to do a show where they spoke Spanish and we didn't translate it. We don't, there's no translation. And I wanted it to be, uh, because I had to look up what a bar mitzvah was when I watched TV when I was a kid. I had to pull down my Encyclopedia <laughs> Britannica so people can go to the Google. Uh, but I thought if, if I say something in the room and the guys that don't speak Spanish laugh, it can go in because right. it is, a, it it's, is universal. Yeah. it's universal. Yeah. And so what was really exciting for me about having, we have Salvadorian, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Mexican in our room. And it's so great to see the things that all of us experience, to see the universality because I think that Latinos focus a lot on, I'm, we're different. And that's because of the starvation, right? We're yeah. so starved that when something's on TV about us, we want it to be everything about us or else ugh, we're never going to watch it. Yeah. And it's because we're starved. I get it. I get it. But from this side, you know, when things are good, let them be good. When things are good, let them be good. If it's a stride in, the, in one direction, we have a Latina writing group. Uh, America and Gina have just started this, uh, this confluence of Fiercely Latina where we're trying to get together to just support one another and support our work. Because I think for so long, there was one seat at the table. Right. And it's not that way anymore. There are many tables, and we are going to populate the tables. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we need to be supportive of when one of us has a win and when one of us is trying to get it right. Because we're still dealing with a 1,000 people and networks and studios, and a th it's, a th it's a miracle to make yeah. a TV show, really. Yeah. So what we can do is what, we're, is what we're doing, which is telling the story. But being one person, I mean, there were rooms that I was the one person, and it's hard. It's hard yeah, to, it's you know, it's like, yeah. well, Gloria, what do you think? I mean, <laughs> it's like, and then sometimes yeah, yeah. you say it, and they don't care, and they write the thing anyway, or, and your or, name's Or the there. perception that somehow you're, you're just the naysayer, or you're pushing right, back, or right. you're, you know, the spoil sport on a really funny, you know, horrible ethnic joke, you know, and, and I've been in rooms where I'm not only the only woman, but the only person of color, yes. like in blocks around me, yes, that's <laughs> you right. know, that's right. and so it, 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 the pressure, the pressure was unbelievable to toe the line, to not ruffle feathers, but still try to get in like one sentence, you know, if I got in one joke in like one episode, I was so excited, you know, and so to have the pressure of like, oh, I have to represent women and I have to re represent Latinos. It, it, it just too, too, much. <laughs> too, too much for one person. And so I do feel like, I feel like if I ever get a show, I, when I get a show, when I get a show, when, thank you, right. okay, thank yeah, you. It's a matter of um, time. <laughs> that I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I don't care if people will say that I'm, um, that it's reverse discrimination or whatever. Like I am going to populate my room with women and That's right. good <laughs> LGBTQ yes. and people of yes. color. Yes. End yes. of story. Yes. I mean, yes. maybe I'll have like one white 
assistant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He when can he's get the coffee. Assistant that guy. guy's a great guy. I love that guy. Looks like Ryan Gosling, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, when I was on East Los High, the, the most amazing experience was that Carlos Portugal, who was Latino, he's Cuban, gay, um, he made a point of only hiring Latinos in every position that he could, and only women. So our room was completely Latina women. And you would think, you know, from the stereotypes that we would be at each other's throats and like, you know, <laughs> but it was the loveliest room just, oh my God, so much fun, the best room. And, and just to have everyone relating to each other about their families, and even though we're all from different countries, we were all from, you know, yeah. Colombia, Puerto Rico, Mexican, Cuban, it was very similar. You know, yeah. it's, it's pretty much the same. And so to have the stories and to have that camaraderie in, in, in a professional setting, I, I'd never experience, experienced anything like it. And I remember saying like no matter what happens this will stay with me this feeling and i i want to recreate that i really do so yeah and talking about i mean universal universality Un universality yeah. universality yeah. thank you yeah. <laughs> my english is not as good it's very good um <laughs> um i was i i also had the experience not only uh i Divius Mace was adapted, but I also uh, worked with an American writer in the adaptation of one another of my shows in Mexico, which was a political show. And uh, it was such an amazing experience because, um, because I saw the process of him turning a Mexican political show. I mean, how, how, how universal can politics be when politics is very like very unique to each country personal yeah yeah but um but i saw that process uh of this american writer who's craig turk he was at the time uh show running um the good wife mm -hmm. and he turned this uh show that i created in mexico into an american show and it was such an amazing thing because what was universal about it, it was that it was a woman fighting against crime, you know, and there's crime everywhere because she wanted a better world for her children, you know? And that's something that if you are a woman anywhere mm -hmm. in the world, you can, you can do, mm -hmm. right? So it, it also... Um, raises the question of you don't have to tell a Cuban story or you don't have to tell a Colombian story. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just being a woman in this world and, you know, I am Mexican, but I can tell a story about a woman that fights crime anywhere in the world, yeah. Yeah. you know? And um, and I don't know, I just I just wanted to share that thought because I know we need to see ourselves represented in a screen, but there's also all these stories that are universal that we can tell from our own perspective that are not even unique to any, you right. know, to like to any sure. nationality or any, you know. Yeah. And, and I think those stories should be also there, you yes. know, created yeah. by yes. Latina women not necessarily like, like a content that refers to a specific reality or circumstance, no? Sure. But like these universal stories that are generated. Basically what yeah. white men have been allowed to do, right? You know, for a thousand yeah. years. Tell every story. You yeah. know, yeah. They, they can write about a, a geisha. You know, I'm forgetting the name. But, you know, the, the best-selling uh, book. They can, the, you know, I've written... Yeah. I've had scripts where I've had a male lead, and, and every time it's just like like people's heads explode, like, oh my God, you write men so well, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's like, men? okay, I'm a writer, I, I do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I try to get into all kinds of different characters, all kinds of different sure. colors, you know, people that aren't even um, like non-humans, you know? Uh -huh. I love science fiction. And so why, 
why, you know, I've, I, and I'll, I'll tell you this anecdote, I won't mention any names, but when I was still writing in sitcoms, which I think are the toughest rooms of all, you know, ch comedy is just, mm -hmm. it is tough, <laughs> tough. Um, there was a show and it was, um, it was, it was supposed to be like a, a, a working class, blue collar Puerto Rican in New York and his family. You know, and they were looking for the Latino, you know, like the one Latino writer that they were going to bring in. So they <laughs> they carted us all oh, in, nice. and um, <laughs> and I interviewed for the show, and I had, I mean, I had such rapport with the showrunner. We were talking, I mean, for like two hours. This guy was amazing, and we really connected. And I thought for sure I got the job. And then he told my um, my agent that he didn't think I was Latina enough. What? Yeah, he didn't, I, I wasn't Latina enough, and I was too, um, it was kind of like a, a, a reverse compliment, like I, I was too um, upscale, that's what he said, I was too upscale, <laughs> okay, so like I had, I should have come in in like, like a costume, and, and you know, like thrown some gang signs out or something, and then, so that, that's what we're dealing with, and I mean, this guy was a sophisticated guy. Well, well, but I think what you're you're all touching upon is the fact that these this idea of Latino stories, mm -hmm. or what a, a or what a Latino experience is again in this monolithic form. But it, on the other hand, we and I'm including myself and as a a person of color, we have to be able to negotiate their stories. You know, we, we have to be able to, you know, that your experience of being the only one, been there, done that. Um, and, and one of the things that, that you're put in a position to do is you, you don't have a choice about understanding how they see the world. That's right. And, and so one of the things that I find really amazing in all of these shows is that the subjectivity is shifting. You're yeah. seeing it through Penelope's eyes. You're seeing it through Betty's eyes. You're th seeing it through Jane's experience. Mm -hmm. And when you are able to s shift that subjectivity, you can begin to tell stories that aren't just about what they think a Latina story is. Yeah or what right. they think uh, um, an LGBTQ story is, or what a black story is, or what a working class story is. Right. Um, yeah. and, and so I, I guess um, I, I wanted to go back to the idea of genre for a second, particularly um, with um, the idea that, um, you know, a couple of these story, shows came, were adapted from telenovelas, and, um, you know, the Norman Lear sitcoms of the 70s are absolute classics mm -hmm. um, about how you negotiate these particular genre to tell stories that you want to tell, meaning stories that are significant um, in terms of, and I hate using the word authenticity, because then somebody's do it using a checklist, but mm -hmm. um, but that resonate for you in terms of that kind of emotional realism, mm -hmm. where you're saying, "Yeah, I get that." Yeah. Um, so, uh, could could you talk a little bit about? Because uh, I'm really curious. I've heard from other people as well how hard the sitcom. <laughs> um, Writer's room is. Yeah, it's rough. I don't know if this <laughs> answers part of that question, but um, when I when I when I came here to write Jane, which is a show based on a telenovela, and um, I, I I was confronted a little bit with the with the genre itself. Like um, I was writing telenovelas in Mexico then, but like not the traditional telenovela. Mm -hmm. I was because there's so 
different right. kinds of telenovelas. Yeah. I was not writing the traditional telenovela. My telenovelas were pretended to be <laughs> a little bit different. Right. Like, not like the typical uh, telenovela woman that is suffering, and you know, like, yeah. like something so you were, different. So you were breaking genres I in was, Mexico. You were yeah, trying to in Mexico. Yeah. But I came here, and uh, the expectation of the room was that I was like the telenovela expert, right? right? right. So as the stories unfolded, uh, of course, um, there was a lot of anxiety in the room because I pitched several things that I know work because telenovelas have huge audiences, yeah. you know, the old ones, the new ones, all of them, mm -hmm. you know? and, and the room was very nervous about taking the advice or the story move because it kind of, it's not like the way it, uh, network television is or because TV, American TV series are more grounded or less, uh, you know, tropey because they they're broad or melodramatic even. Stylized, yeah. The crying, you know, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. whole thing, the... The, uh, no, but the audiences are going to know that she's going to end up with this guy. Well, And I'm like, you know, it doesn't matter. In telenovelas, you know from episode one who's going to end up in the... Yeah. <laughs> because they show it to you in the credit, in the beginning credits, you know. They're kissing. They're kissing. And you see it every day. So you know they're going to end up together and they're going to get married at the end, no? But you don't, you don't care because right. you want to see how. No, but there's, so speaking about, you know, those fights inside the room um, that are all about the genre, you know, about what works and what doesn't. And, and, and I think Jane is, um, because this is my only experience in American television, Jane, that's it. I came from Mexico and I started working <laughs> at Jane. It's been, um, it's been this negotiation with the genre, right, which is, which has been very, very interesting, but I'm the only one representing the genre, yeah. right? But it, I think that the, 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 the result, the, 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 the series kind of um, projects that in a, in a way, no? Mm -hmm. where, where there's, there's this combination of things that are happening in, in the show that are very telenovela, but at the same time very... American series. Right. I don't know. It's it's for me. It's been like a total discovery because it's a telenovela, but it's not. Yeah. You right. know. So it's been very very interesting, and I think um, it has been a, a a very interesting and very rewarding experience talking about only genre, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How two cultures come together come together in the room and and right. sometimes they collapse no they, they they fight each other but in the end it's like it's it's another thing right i feel no it is such an another thing that when we enter the emmys uh, th there was a whole discussion about are we a comedy oh, right but That's it's a right. one hour but oh no it's a drama what is it <laughs> no? what is it yeah because we have like Crazy telenovela turns, but also like the crying and the There should be comedic hour, Emmy. It I should be its own really thing. Should. It's a different, it's, I feel like, and yeah. also half hour dramas and half, half hour, hour dramas. comedies. Of course. Yeah, don't get me started. Yeah. yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. But well, yeah, that's, that's yes. only like an anecdote about. Yes. No, but been. I think that's. It's, that, it's an interesting. I think it's an interesting one, and I think that's one of the reasons that Jane's getting Peabody's and Jane oh, absolutely. Is, yeah. is getting you know, such critical acclaim. Because yeah. that kind of negotiation that's happening in those rooms is also happening for us while we're watching the show. You know, that we're, you feel like you're learning as you're watching. Yeah. And, but it's done in a way that's entertaining because if it's not entertaining, the, the yeah. audience doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, but, but I do, because I think it, it, there are ways that, that Jane navigates or, or negotiates with the telenovela that are different from the way that Betty did. No, right. Totally. Right. You know, yeah. and, and because I felt, feel like um, Jane will sweep me into these, you know, big 
epic sort of dramatic emotional moments and then it totally undercuts it with this really sly humor yeah <laughs> um so it, it, and the thing that just again with Betty one of the things that I always thought was so fascinating is how by pushing it so far right at the same time they were making so many points about race and sexuality yeah. right. and class um that it I, that I think some audience, some members of the audience got, right. but not, not but it worked on yeah. different levels. Yeah, it worked yes. on for different for levels people. for different yes. audiences. Yeah, yeah. And and, um, and 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 that's why, again, I I am a sitcom junkie. I have been <laughs> forever. I watched the original one day at a time, and Romano, um, and. and the big thing that she was braless and you know, oh, right. <laughs> I, and when I when I I totally binged um, the the first season of One Day at a Time, and and when I did, what it allowed me to do is to and, and that's another format issue. I knew them, like when it gets to the point, and uh, spoiler alert if you haven't watched it. <laughs> When the coming out ep episode, right. mm -hmm. when you, mm -hmm. I got there, it was um, like I, as liberal as I am and as open as I am, I understood where Penelope was yeah. because it was about her child right, mm -hmm. and what her child would be facing yeah. on top fear of being a person of right. color. Yeah, that's right. And, and so, and I thought, that it did it so well. And then it resonates back to the whole idea of the quinceañera and quince. Yeah, even say quince, I don't know why. No. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It, 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 it had so much meaning because, and you get rewarded. And, and, and I think that's a, another difference in terms of format. Yes, and we're fortunate with Netflix. So the idea started with Norman, for those that don't know, it's it was a, remake of the original series, which aired in 75, which is when I was born. So I did not watch the original series. Uh, and I was very reluctant to write anything personal about my family because I had seen so many friends sell shows about their families and have no real participation in it. And I, my family is everything to me. So it's like a precious, you know, it's like giving your heart and handing it to someone. Uh, and I really felt I had done 10 years of mainstream television where I wrote exclusively for white characters. So I had proven myself in that form. I had done single camera, multi camera, one hour drama, one hour procedural. So I had crushed it on that front and said I could do all of it. Now I really want to be the boss because I'm tired of comedy rooms, frankly. And I want to be the person that is hiring people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, and so it was co it coincided with Norman wanting to sit down. And I sat down with him and as I talk with him and he was so curious and cares so much and has such a genuine disarming quality about him, I knew that this was gonna be the right fit. And there was already another writer attached, Mike Royce, so we sort of melded our families. Uh, Mike's daughter was coming out at the time that we started the series. So he said, you know, so much of the show is personal to you, could I have this? Could, could I have this be my part? Yeah. And so it's really his kids, and like my mom and I, is the, how we started it. Uh, and then the room filled it out. We have two LGBTQ women in our room as well who helped us with that coming out mm -hmm. story, which was so well received. And, and we, we really put our guts, I mean, we cry a lot in the room. We have veterans come to the room and tell us their stories, women in service, because she's a veteran as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, my parents came to the room and talked about Pedro Pan and coming here uh, under those those harrowing circumstances, and it's a it's a space that became very comfortable for us to tell real, grounded stories. But in the you know, Norman gives us the ability to do stories where there's comedy, but there's also bottom. There's something you're really talking about, and that was very intriguing to me. And then the Netflix format, which gives you 26 to 28 minutes to tell the story, as opposed to 21 minutes, which is what broadcast is. Right. I'm, I just sold the show to CBS and I'm writing a broadcast. So my, my, my draft right now is 60 pages and I'm like, oh, oh. I have to cut, <laughs> I have to cut yeah. so much because I have 21 minutes and commercials oh now that I have to deal with. 
Uh, so it's I'm so grateful to have had the process of Netflix, who gives us like no notes and Norman and and all of that. It really allowed for us to be able to tell this type of story. Uh, that's a sitcom, but the way he did it in the 70s, which was much more grounded and talked about real things and and tried to push the needle in terms of conversation and conversation starting, especially amongst family members and, and one another. So, Yeah, and, and I think, you know, that idea of the social sitcom, the yeah, sort of right. reworking yeah. of the domestic comedy to deal with the world mm -hmm. right. at the same time was, is, is just... And it's so persuasive. I, I mean, it can have such an impact on the audience. And because, again, while you're laughing, you, their mouths are open, you shove the truth in. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and so, it, it, you know, I, I think, and, co and I know drama is hard, but comedy is so hard. And particularly, I was thinking when you were talking earlier about having done the, the Mexican telenovelas and then coming into the hybrid that is Jane, the idea of translation, again, um, you know, it, because there are, spe there are just things that are in the specific vernacular of different cultures. Yeah. Well, that's why NCIS is the number one show in the world, because it doesn't need translation, it doesn't. Right. whereas comedy does. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. True. Humor is, I mean, even Divius Mates, no? Yes. Because yeah. it was a half-hour comedy in Mexico. And, yeah, the humor is something that is very, is so particular to the culture, right. and that it's, it's hard to translate, you know, but... Um, and as you were saying, you know, in Jane, we can get like pretty hardcore with the crying, but then there's like, boom, yeah. right? The, yeah. the joke. And, uh, and if it was like a, if it was a telenovela, we'd, we wouldn't have that joke. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I mean? It's right. like, so you can, you can totally see the, like the, 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 what I was talking about, no? Like the two genres and also like, in this, in this constant conversation with each other, the mm -hmm. two, yeah, where we can get very telenovelesque and very mellow, almost melodramatic, but yes. then it boom, right? Yeah. It cuts. It, it 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 goes exactly. The joke goes exactly where it has to go to stop that, and then become something else. It's that it's really. It's interesting. interesting that we're. It, it's, this is very. just occurring to me now, but it does seem to me like these three shows are very interesting to talk about because, starting with Betty, which mm -hmm. was really an Americanized telenovela, yeah. like mm -hmm. everything was broad and big, right. moving to half and half. Yeah. Right where right. it's yeah, a yeah, it's a one hour co comedy, but also this telenovela format and the playing of the fun of that to a sitcom. Like it it is these and and what's interesting too is. Uh, to speak for a moment about men and Latino men on television, because these are stories about women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, for me, this year we tried to get, we've been trying to get a, a male lead on the show for her. And w I was very struck because very name Latino actors sent their tape in, and their tape of the work they have done comprised mainly of Latino lovers, cops, and um, murderers, Cops. criminals. criminals. Oh, criminal. Yeah. There was not like a dad, <laughs> a soccer coach, nothing, nothing. Okay. <laughs> and it really, I was surrounded by wonderful Latino men in my life. And so to not, to, to I can't imagine that the world does not know that that is a thing. <laughs> that wonderful Latino men, wonderful fathers and brothers and cousins that made my life magical uh, do not appear on screen the way they need to. And so what was great in doing this new show is one of the main characters is this 50-year-old dad who loves his wife, and he's a business owner, and he's an immigrant. And th that's, that's the stuff that we're getting to do. That's okay. the stuff where we're able to see the need, and then in our next project, say this, we want to fill this need, and on and on and on, and supporting one another. Yeah. Yeah, that's and right. continuing this good work and 
and putting it out there, but telling just stories about people and living their life and right. paying their bills mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of the fun that that is the human experience. Fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or fun and not so yeah. fun. <laughs> just a human experience, exactly. though, as yeah. you say. But, it, but uh, again, I, I just, you know, again, uh, just saying how much I admire the fact that you're getting that emotional realism into things that are com a comedic is, um, I don't need them anymore. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been paying attention to them anyway. Um, oh, I, I think that is oh. a signal that it might be time to do questions. <laughs> play the clip. Oh, play says. the clip. Oh, play the clip. I totally play. forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, There's you guys were there. This is just sort of an, an overview of what we've been talking about. Um, the whole time. I like your poncho. <laughs> My dad got me one in Guadalajara. Milan, Dolce and Gabbana, fall. Oh. Betty Suarez? Hi, that's me. Um, I have a hard copy of my resume if you need it. Should I follow you? Actually, there's been a mistake. A mistake? All the entry level positions we were hiring for They've been filled. I'm sorry. Um, sir? Well, you got me here. I thought I could tell you a little about myself. Magazines are my passion ever since I was a kid. And I can't imagine a more amazing place to start my career than Mead Publications. I know most of your magazines inside out. I try to devour as much as I can. Clearly. Also, I've learned so much through them. You know, stuff so beyond my world, like like who the up and comers are on the London art scene, or or what the political machinations in Darfur are all about, or which Bali resort is considered the most romantic in the world. And I have tons of ideas. I'm always jotting stuff down on the subway, but I'm getting ahead of myself, sir. All I really want is a chance. Bye. Any position or publication. I can't say hundred words a minute. Ugly Betty, streaming anytime on the new ABC app. Our story begins 13 and a half years ago, when Jane Gloriana Villanueva was a mere 10 years old. It should be noted that at a mere 10 years old, James' passions include, in no particular order, her family, God, and grilled cheese sandwiches. Mira la flor que tienes en tu mano, Jane. This is Jane's grandmother, Alba Gloriana Villanueva. Her passions include God and Jane, in that particular order. Mira que tan perfecta es, que tan pura. Ahora, mija, estrujala en tus manos. Really, Mom? Shh. But this is so lame. Mommy, shh. This is Jane's mother, Xiomara Gloriana Villanueva. Her passions include Jane and Paulina Rubio. The order is not important. Estruja la flor, Jane. Bien. Ahora haz que se vea como nueva otra vez. Vamos, anda, trata. I can't. Así es. Nunca puedes volver atrás, y eso es lo que sucede cuando pierdes tu virginidad. And so Jane waited, which wasn't always easy. This is Jane's fiancé. He's a detective. Their life was perfectly on track until... Oh, there you are, Dr. Elver. You have an insemination in seven and a pap in eight. Uh, yeah, an insemination in a pap. Yeah, I Should got I, it. You... No, I got, I got it. She does not got it. Are you ready for your insemination? Hi, yes. I artificially inseminated the wrong woman. And the father. Dr. Alvar's brother, Rafael, who Jane kissed once five years ago. Only now he's married to Petra. Got all that? There's more. Jane did not know that her favorite telenovela star was actually her father, 
who her mother recently got back in touch with. And now you are caught up. If Grandpa's family was so rich, why aren't we rich? Bueno, porque hubo problemas familiares, pelea entre hermanos, y tu abuelito pues decidió venirse para acá conmigo, para Norteamérica. Pero el problema era que no nos era... no era permitido. Why? Ay, mi amor, es muy complicado, ¿eh? Stupid immigration laws. your friends close, but your maids closer. So uh, what's this history project you're working on? And then maybe later you can show me how to turn into a bat. Your mom's kind of mean. I'm obsessed with her. Oh, we're coming up! I swear to God, if that vieja calls me Maria one more time. Mrs. Doyle has Alzheimer's. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Hey, I'm messing with you. She's just racist. This story starts with us together. What happened to your face? What happened to your face? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was hanging out with my friends. It's hard to turn it off. <laughs> Problem. Your daughter does not want to have a king sis. Why? We already booked the room, and I found a great band. Okay, it's your brother with an iPod and a playlist, but it's a very good playlist. <laughs> I went to war, I got hurt, and when I came back, there was an organization set up to help me and other veterans get the help we need. Oh my Keep it together with your friend. I think it's time to leave. I thought you said I was supposed to keep it together. Well, that's true. <laughs> We're not doing a regular debate. We argue the opposite side to better understand each other. So I'm you. So you want to crush my heart into pieces? That's not me, that's her. You make me sound like I have an accent. <laughs> I haven't even shown you guys the best part. Play my jam. No! Oh, it probably would have been much better if I did that at the beginning. <laughs> before we started talking, but they're fabulous. I just wanted to get as much time in with them as possible. But now I do think it's time to um, ask, open it up for you folks to ask questions. Please wait for the mic. Here you are. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here and for representing our community. This is so exciting. I can't even tell you. 
Um, I've been on the edge of my seat. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about each of your um, beginnings in the industry and if there's any advice you can give to, like I'm an actor and a writer, my name is Angelina de Guadalupe and I would love your perspective on, um, on, on getting started and some of those challenges and how you overcame them. Man, that's a whole panel right there. Yeah, wow. yeah I know. <laughs> that's a whole that's panel. That's a workshop. <laughs> I know. Well, we'll try to do fast, right? Okay. okay, so I was an actor. I started as an actor. I went to Loyola Marymount here in Los Angeles. And Me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> woo woo, LMU. Uh, and when I came out, it, it literally, I'm not kidding. This is, ten, this is 10 years ago. I was auditioning for, I didn't graduate 10 years ago, guys. Stop it. <laughs> but kind of, almost, almost. But around 10 years ago, when I was auditioning, Everything was gangbanger's girlfriend and gangbanger's sister. Everything. So I would go in and be like, Julie, put the gun down. For no joke. That is an actual line from something I auditioned for. Uh, and so I started writing my own material. That's, I, it came, I didn't think I was going to be a writer. I really didn't. I just wrote out of necessity because I thought, certainly there's like a school teacher or a lawyer or a social worker or something that looks like me. So that's why I started writing. So I was completely self-taught. And then I decided to go to grad school. And so I went to London, and uh, I went to Uni University of London for grad school. And then when I came back, I didn't know anybody in this town. And this is before YouTube. I feel like now people can write and put their stuff out and shoot it themselves and edit it themselves. It's an incredible, incredible and exciting time. I knew how to write plays. So I booked the Hudson Theater on, on Santa Monica Boulevard with no set. I, I asked my friends to do the parts, and I put up plays. And the first two nights, I, I booked it on my own money. Con nada, man. I'm telling you, I had no, it was with nothing. The fee, like the 275 bucks to put the show up per night, which is what it was at the time. And... Uh, Hired my friends, and I went to all my local chair, all the local charities that I really supported: breast cancer research, lupus research, uh, everything, Children's Network. I gave them free tickets to opening the first two opening shows. So I had packed, and then I gave the actors free tickets to the first two shows. And those first shows, why we were making no money, but people told other people. And the rest of the run of the show, I had a line around the block, and so that's how I got an agent and a manager, and et cetera. But I would say. You got to just put, find a way to put your work out there. Find a way to put your work out there. If it's shooting your own stuff with your iPhone, there's movie, a movie with Tangerine was made all on an iPhone. There, you can put your work out there. You can put your work out there in a way that you couldn't before. You can write for yourself in a way that people didn't do before. And I think that we are in a time of the, of the writer, actor, creator. And so I think put it out there. And there's a great Steve Martin quote, get so good, keep doing it so they can't ignore you anymore. And that's what you do. That's right. Oh, I don't know if my mic. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I I did a more traditional. I I went to undergrad back east in broadcast and film at BU Boston University for my my BU peeps. Um, and then after that, I came out to to LA and I had gotten into SC to USC for their um, a master's program in producing, but um, because I. <clears throat> I felt like I had gotten enough um, creative instruction at BU, and I'd heard that this program at SC, this, the producer's program, was this really great, um, you know, way in to the to the studio system here in Los Angeles, and it would be, you know, kind of teaching you the entertainment business and um, being savvy. <clears throat> And so, uh, so I, I went in that program. And when I first got out of school, I was actually working as a development executive. Um, and you know, there was a lot of le legitimacy to that. And I know that, like, my mom encouraged me to keep that job forever. You know, and when I started trying to write and do my own thing, it was really only because um, uh, they had let go a bunch of deals. Like the company I was working with, our deal got let go at Disney. So I started um, writing coverage for um, a bunch of the agencies in town and just being at home alone writing all the time. And I thought to myself, you know what? If I'm going to get paid 50 bucks a script to do coverage, I might as well just start writing my own stuff. Plus, it was actually really wonderful because I was reading just, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of scripts. So in a way, it was just kind of like 
just being seeped, steeped in, in story and really kind of learning again on my own how to, how to break story. So um, from there, I, um, I was doing coverage, but then I just started sending out um, short stories. I didn't even start doing um, like scripts yet. I was just doing uh, articles and short stories and that kind of thing. And then I ended up getting a column in a magazine back when they were in paper. And uh, and so and then from that, you know, I, I wrote a, a column for um, for a magazine that doesn't exist anymore about being a D girl on the make in LA, like just having living off of um, going to screenings and getting food afterwards, and you know, like not being able to afford my leased car after I'd gotten laid off from my from my job. And so that got made into like I I ended up doing that column for about two years, and then that got bought by um, v VH1. They were, doing, um, they were doing scripted stuff for a minute and they bought that as a pilot. Like I, I sold all my columns all together and, and they paid me to adapt it into a pilot. And that's how I ended up getting into TV. I got an agent from that. So um, I think really it's just like digging into your creativity and, and, and not letting anyone tell you no, you know? And, and there's, you can, anyone can, if you're a writer, you can write in your room. You don't need a lot. Like you just need a pen and paper, you know. And um, there's something really powerful about that still. I mean, I uh, come from another country, so it's like <laughs> totally different for me. But but ever uh, since I got <laughs> here, I've heard all these stories about how people uh, got into TV or films or whatever, and. Everybody says there's like no way, no one way, right? There's so many ways. You just gotta keep writing. That's it. I mean, I did that in Mexico in my own country. I wrote and wrote and I started doing films and people liked them. And it's really funny because I was, I wrote commercial uh, films in my country. And uh, that's what, it's really funny because they, they, they don't travel that much because it's not what, what it's right. expected from Mexican films. No, we're talking about what it's expected. Right. But um, but yeah, you gotta you, you, you gotta keep writing. That's that's it. You know, and, and there's no and one way. Read. The yeah. library is such an untapped resource, you guys. The library you can get any play, the internet you can get any script. I mean, you can, you can be self-taught. You can watch old TV shows now on Hulu. I had to go to the Museum of TV and Radio back in my day, which was, is now yeah. the Paley Center. I had to go there and I'd pay my $5 and I'd go oh, yeah. put the headphones on and like watch for hours. Now you can do all that in your house and watch all the great TV shows. You can teach yourself how to do this by watching and reading, really. And also, is it true, uh, just get a job in any production yeah. oh yes that it I, doesn't I would matter say, doing what that's right because if you keep writing and you're there already yes. you can and you, you, meet you meet people you meet people that become people. your fans and start mm -hmm. to root for you and start to think of you for projects exactly. for well, sure and also your your network you know as you're going to meet other all kinds of people just like yourself trying to do the same thing and as you go up you'll you know you kind of see each other and, and you kind of help each other out as much as you can. And um, it's really amazing to see some of the people that I was, you know, I was an intern at Disney before, when I was still in grad school and some of the temps and like, you know, just like all the junior people hung out together and those people are all, you know, leading studios now and running shows and it's, it's kind of cool that, you know, I think really the only thing I would say that has been key for me is perseverance, you know? Perseverance, like don't let anyone make you think that you have to quit because you don't, you really don't. And, and it's like a war of attrition, I think. You know, that, yeah. that's like what I've been able to do. It's like, I will wear them out <laughs> and I will still be here. So um, I think that that's a big part of just being here, just kind of showing up. You're welcome. Hi, um, I'm Jasmine Campbell. Hi, Gloria. Nice to see you. And uh, it's um, actually um, uh, thank you for being here on a Sunday. I'm I'm a writer and f formerly was um, a development executive myself. And I have a very specific question for you guys because uh, 
um, wanted to ask you two questions. The first one is, um, what is something that you absolutely religiously have to do when you're in a pitch room, right? Like when you're pitching in an idea or even, even to your own writers, something that you, that you sort of keep, you know, on the surface in order to, um, I guess, you know, grab everyone's ideas and, you know, be supportive of that. And then the next question is sort of the opposite of that, which is, what is something that you recommend people maybe not to do? Maybe like a, like a mistake that you may have learned from or something like that, whether you were in a pitch room or you were just kind of in a situation, you know, professionally, just for people who are, you know, kind of forging their way through. And thank you. Interesting. What to do yeah. as you're pitching, right? That's your question. What to do when you're pitching. I think the first thing you have to do is you have to believe in what you're pitching. That, I mean, for me, it's all about that. I mean, I've pitched several things and... And it's just, you know, there's, I don't think there's the what to do and what not. I mean, I, I haven't thought about that too much, but it's about believing in what you're pitching because when you believe in what you're pitching, you you kind of, uh, how do you say? Project it. Project, yeah. yeah. Mm. And, yeah, so, of course, you have to do a lot of work before you yeah. believe in it because sometimes uh, there's things that that you're, you, you know, you, they're not just your ideas, but someone else's, you, so you have to make them yours somehow. But yeah, it's about believing in, the, in them, and really, because then you project that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think, think it's guys? pitching for me, I think is just telling a really good story. Mm -hmm. That's it, you're just telling them a really good story, and if you're excited about the story, and you're telling them the story, and you're like, and then, and then yeah. This happens, <laughs> yeah. You know, and then and then they get involved in the story, and they're interested in the story. Um, I think also taking the temperature of the room is always really important. Sometimes they're not into it. I mean, I literally had one day at a time. We went to Amazon too, and the he was on his phone almost the whole time. You know, so that happens too, and they ended up loving it. So you're like, really? Uh, then maybe you look at me in the eye sometime. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, there have been, yeah, so there are pitches where, there are pitches where they seem completely uninterested and are yawning, and there are some pitches where they seem super into it, and then they don't buy it. So I think if you're just telling a really good story and you're passionate about telling that story, that, that's a good, that's a good um, pitch. My advice for pitching would be, it's all about editing, and I, I'm really, um, a stickler about going back and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and getting it down so it's just the the the, the seed of the seed <laughs> because I really do feel like it, just more and more people everyone has severe ADD and you know a lot of these executives are listening to so much stuff and it's it's almost like you you have to winnow it down until it's just like the essence of of what the story is and just have like keep, be able to keep their attention. So um, you have to be able to be really, um, I guess like a harsh editor with yourself. And, um, and then I, the other thing I do is I always practice with, um, with people, friends, family, anybody I can get. And um, you know, I run it through a, a million times. And then it's really interesting because even with your friends with, you know, what you would call a warm room, um, because ostensibly they like you, um, <laughs> you know, you can tell, you can, t you can see when their eyes start glazing over, yeah. you can see, and you immediately know like, okay, that's not working, or I don't need this little piece, this explains too much, I can shorten this, mm -hmm. and it's just so helpful. So, um, you know, that's just a little practical, practical tip mm -hmm. I would give. Hi, um, I'm Cheryl Quintana Leader. Oops, sorry. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, I saw you at the um, Imagen Awards and you won, Gloria. Yeah, that yeah. was awesome. <laughs> um, I also wanted to say that since 2014, Latinas have been the majority of people in the state of California, just so you know. And I think it's no accident that there are more women's stories because it's high time that we get back into all stories when they say, oh, be true to the story, well, who got to tell the story? It, 
the power is in the writer and writing can create all those stories without so much detail to, oh, what it was and how it was and this and that, you know, it's about you creating it. So I wanted to know, are you looking for projects that you want to do in the future? And then we also host a Latinas in Hollywood, Our Stories, that uh, is an educational conference for high school and uh, uh, college women um, every year. And we'd love to have you the next year, which will be at, Gu at Google. So awesome. I would just like to know, are you looking for new projects, especially um, you in the middle who said you wanted to do sci-fi? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because as a writer, I was the winner of the Hispanic Film Project for First Time Writers. I did a 35 millimeter film that I wrote in three days. I was in development at Fox and Paramount and Sony. And now we just finished a, a sci-fi called Creo 8, and it's uh, Latinas who are superheroines who are in the STEM field. Awesome. And we oh, just need post-production help. <laughs> Great. Well, this is a great question. This is a great question because this is also something that happens a lot on Latino panels. Everybody wants us to do their work with them, which is such like the most awesome compliment that anyone could give. The thing is, I have 20 things I've been waiting 10 years to do, right? Yeah, so like I already have one, I have so many of my own projects that I want to do. Plus, if you're on a deal, which I'm, I'm on a deal at Sony, I can't read anyone else's stuff anyway because Sony owns my brain. They don't own my mind, they just own my brain. <laughs> and they, uh, they don't want me to look at anything in case it's similar to anything I'm already doing. So that's, that's that, so unfortunately, no. But it sounds like you're doing it. It sounds like you don't need me, you don't need, I mean, it sounds like you're making this happen. And what we need is for you to do it, and then you to do it, and you to do it, and you to do it, right? So uh, th that, that is, that's my answer. Um, well, I'm not sure what the question was. I mean, I know she was asking you yes, specifically. Yeah. Oh, okay. Am I looking? Well, again, I I'm always I I don't have a deal, so I'm happy to um, try to help and read other people's material. I don't, you know, I I'm totally open to that. She's I, open to that's huge. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I you know. I, I, within I'm not reason, gonna, guys, within don't reason. all run up to, to yeah. Viv after. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> me too. I mean, I, I came here for Jane and I wasn't able to develop, but I was, I have a ton of shows that I developed in Mexico and that I want to bring here. And this is my first year that I can develop stuff here. But of course, I mean... I'm always happy to read anybody. Yeah. And just also remember, as Latinas, we're the blend of all the races. So we're yes. black, white, yes. and we're Asian. Every. Yes. And we all That's came right. from other countries to those other countries. So mm -hmm. when they say, can it be like Venezuelan or can it be like Cuban or whatever, you know, it's we come from all those different countries. That's right. Of course. Hi, I'm Silvia. I'm here with Comadres para las Americas, so thank you. <laughs> uh, I find myself jumping for joy when I see a show and all of a sudden Gina Rodriguez is actually Latina without <laughs> like being on a Latino show, right? And I also cringe when someone's supposed to be Guatemalan because I'm actually Guatemalan and they got a Puerto Rican accent. But, you know, I guess, you know, we take what we can, right? I get that. <laughs> However, my question then is, Aside from social media and tweeting and hey thanks, like who's the best person to give feedback to? I mean, I'm I'm personally not trying to be in the industry, but I am watching the industry, right? I'm the consumer. So please understand that tokenism does not work. <laughs> tokenism does not work. You want to have a Latino on the show, then give them a coach. Give them a dialect coach. Yeah. Like invest in the product that you're actually trying to have consumed, and, and don't think we're stupid, please. Yeah, but we so, do. We do. Well, that's what, like, so who's yeah. the best person? Who's, I mean, if, if, I mean, I can tweet the show, right? Yeah, but you can tweet. Is I mean, it the I director, think, is it no, the? No, the network. The network. The network, really. Okay. Yeah, the network. Okay. Awesome. But tweeting, uh, it's listen, social media is very powerful. So, I mean, yeah. our president does it. Says. Yeah, <laughs> it's very powerful. They look, they do look, they do yeah. look. Hi, um, 
I just want to say thank you to all of you. I, as a Latina actress here, um, hearing you say that going out for a job, you hear you're not Latina enough. Um, I mean, I can turn on my accent, but like, that's, you know, <laughs> this is your voice. This is my voice. Yes. This is what I sound like. Yes. Um, and so it's just really an honor to be here and see that this is where the future's headed. And Gloria, if someone's coming into your show for an audition tomorrow, how are they going to memorize all that dialogue? You know you need to cut. I know. I'm sorry. You got to so learn it all. It's so long. I love it. I know. <laughs> okay. It's a lot. It's a lot. I know. It's like, what, 13 pages? Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. It's 13 pages. There's someone right down front who's going to... She had... Hi. Thank you for being here. Um... um uh, let's see, I want to see how I want to ask this. I wanted to get the panel's thoughts on a couple of um, things that kind of run through both let, um, Latin characters on television as well as African American, just basically um, ethnic characters. Um, one question that, or one uh, topic that's never really discussed but is very important as to how people are viewed on television is the color line. One thing that, as a consumer, I'm not in development um, anywhere, um, when you constantly see people of a certain ethnicity, but they tend towards whiteness um, in appearance, as well as mannerisms, as well as speech, that says a lot. Um, I think that does relate to what you said about not being Latin enough, or Latina enough, quote unquote. Um, education level, all of those things are attributed to whiteness still, even in 2017. And I guess just to use a broad term, ghettoness is a ter is attributed to more ethnicity, and um, and immigrants, and that's just not fair. So I'd like to get the panel's thoughts on how do you change that um, portrayals, um, and as it relates to the color line. And then another thing I was thinking, um, again with your story, what do you think? How do you think it would be received if you did? Um, it could be online even, it doesn't even have to be on network, but telling your story about how a white executive did tell you you're not, kind of meta, like a little bit behind the scenes oh, sure. of your experience. Because I think that kind of the privileged white male power structure that has been running media and the world, they really need to see themselves. They need to hear themselves saying that to you. So I don't, it's not enough to like say, that's kind of racist. Like, you really need to show them, like, this is you. And how do you think that'd be received? And do you think that might then change the climate? And then we wouldn't have to have so many stereotypes, and you wouldn't have to be stereotyped, and you could have your own voice unfiltered by white privilege. Well, those are, those are all really good points, yeah, really good yeah. questions. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I, I love what you're saying about, about color line, class, how people identify, how they're, they're and, and I think that we do it just one character at a time, one, one script at a time. And I, and you know, all, all we can do is continue to do that. And then when you get your script done or whenever, you know, little by little, uh, we'll, we start moving that. And I, and I think it is happening. I think it's happening you know, it never happens as quickly as we would want it to, but I certainly have seen it in my lifetime. And I really think that, um, it, I think it's generational, you know, and, and I'll be honest when I, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh my God, I, 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 I don't want to say too much, but when I was starting out, when I was in a lot of these comedy rooms and these sitcoms, I really noticed that it was an age thing. And it was almost like the older, the older the, the guys got, the, the more um, kind of indoctrinated they were in their white male privilege. And it was like, a, as they got younger, it was a softer, I mean, there was still sexism or, you know, it was, but it was just very, um, they, they were microaggressions versus right. macro. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I see it changing. You know, will it change in my lifetime? I don't know. Will it change in my son's lifetime? I hope so. But um, all we can do is, you, you know, you got to keep it, um, you know, what is it? All, all politics are personal or, you know, it's like, what can I do? Well, I, I always try um, 
in, in a lot of my scripts, I love having all different kinds of people because I really feel, especially if it's set in the US, I, I try to m make it be real, like just kind of reflect what's in the community. So, you know, I have all kinds of friends. I have Asian friends, I have Indian friends, I have Muslim friends, I have white girl friends. And they're right here in the audience and <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> And, and so my scripts, I want to reflect that, that it's like, it's, it's a mishmash, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, we're not all just one block. And I think if we can show it on screen, reflect back reality, it, then it, it just, it like creates this flow and then, yeah. you know, like people will begin to accept it more. Yeah. I think no. it's also, pr oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 it, but I mean, what I, what I was going to say is that Yes, you do the work in, of course, in the room or wherever you are, but it's also a question of being in positions of power. And, and I mean, you are a showrunner and you know that it's a it's, lot it's about... It's up to Gloria to exactly. save us all, basically. <laughs> no, but then she has to lead, trying, but then, you, guys, then you have to deal with the network also. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah. not only well, you, it's, it's also a, different. It's di Netflix is so giving. Right, so yeah. Netflix, I can do, I can do really almost anything I want. So it's purposeful casting as well. You know, this season we have a doctor; she's an African American woman. We have a guy that is in the that's the usher of the movie theater, who's a white guy. That's just what we what I, I'm just trying to show that that we are all that, right? Uh, also, I read that Aziz Ansari wrote this really interesting article about the desexualization of the Asian male and how you never see an Asian male kissing a woman on television, and I was very moved by that, so when Penelope needed a boyfriend, I said, I wanna see Asian men for this role. And so we cast the gorgeous Jay Hayden, who is Korean, uh, as her boyfriend. And so it's, I hadn't, I didn't know, I didn't know about that until I read Aziz's uh, article. And so I think it's about us listening to one another as well, and where the needs are across the board, and also helping one another out when we can. I just like to address one thing too, and, and to the person who had had talked about where do I write. Remember, television first and foremost is a commercial medium. If the consumer tells the network, "I am not happy with this," it's going to have an impact. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and with live tweeting, with all these kinds of websites on on their the show pages. You can write back. You can speak back. More than ever. More than more ever. More than it has ever been. Here's where this is unfortunate, though. So let's say a network decides we're going to do one Latino show this year. Right. We're going to do Cristela. And if everybody doesn't like Cristela, then next year they're going to say, well, we tried Cristela and it didn't work. So we're not going to buy any more Latino shows. That's what they do. Yeah. So it, it, we need to come out and support. We need to come out and say, we like this, or here's what we like about this, as opposed to everybody saying, here's what I don't like about it. Yeah. Say what you love about it, what's impactful to you, what's meaningful oh, to you. Yeah. Because if you show them what you love about it, they will hear that. And I think that's really, really important too. I'm not saying you have to love everything Latino that's out there, but if there's <laughs> something in there that you think is good and impactful and interesting to you, lift that, lift that up and let's talk about that a little bit. Can you please wait for the Yes, mic? that's like, smart. Yes, 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 yes. And because also remember on our side, we there's so much we are up against. There's so much that we're trying to do and we're trying to get right that it's again a miracle when we can get 70% of it to appear on the right. screen. Yeah. Being who we are and dealing with the multitudes of the people that we have to deal with to get it made. Uh, I'm a different generation, and I'm the Where's daughter. Where's this magical voice coming from? <laughs> oh, here you are. Oh. <laughs> Hello. I'm an, I'm, I'm an older generation, sort of, and I'm the daughter of an African-American actor, and I'm born and raised in uh, L.A., but I've been living in New York for a million years. But what was so interesting is when you guys first started talking, it, there was the elephant in the room was really the Anglo male kind of, or, or uh, a lot of Jewish men who kind of run Hollywood and the industry, in a sense. And I was waiting for you to kind of speak about how there's just a, a pervasive sort of uh, thought process uh, as opposed to the many, the multi-ethnic, 
and uh, diverse. And what I'm not hearing is, well, what I am hearing is interesting because listening to you guys, it sounds like the last 40 years in the industry and welcome to being black in the industry kind of, or in LA or in the United States or anywhere, a person of color. So I'm, I'm happy that sister down in the front said what she said, but what I'm not hearing from you guys is what I've heard from a lot of uh, African Americans in the industry over the years is how we need better placement of people of color uh, in within the power levels and being able to green light certain things. Uh, we need people behind the scenes, uh, not just uh, behind the camera or, I mean, it's hard for us to get into unions for one thing, but what about the, uh, th the levels within the industry that green light and that say, well, I want the presence. Where are the black men? Where are the Hispanic men? Where are the Asian men? As well as the women in the industry and how would you advise us to help to change that? Well, I think that is changing. Uh, I think that is changing. That's an interesting point. I think we are talking about it to the level that we can have impact. I can't have impact about who the head of CBS is or who the head of NBC is. So for me personally to spend my time and energy thinking about how I can fix that is not useful to me. Um, it's what I can do is put my head down and do the work. That for me is the most impact I can personally have. To say there is a systemic problem is absolutely accurate. There is. Uh, and so I think the, the best thing that we can do is to support and to let people know that your stories are worthwhile and are worth hearing and please continue to do them. And we're coming out here to, to talk to you about the importance of it so that you will hopefully be inspired to continue doing it and that the many voices will be loud enough so that we can't be ignored. I think that's the. Okay. Hi, ladies. I think I got Hi. here first. Hold up. Uh -huh. Hold it. I've been waiting for oh, a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hold it back. Um, I just want to say hello. Thank you so much for being here. Where were you 20 years ago? <laughs> um, it's. Uh, it's amazing for me, in particular, this, this goes to Gloria. I have no question um, except a hey girl. Um, <laughs> hey girl. <laughs> hey. Um, it's, um, I'm Cuban born. Um, we've spoken in the past recently. Um, and uh, I came here in, uh, to the US in the 80s. And it's amazing for me to finally have seen a show about Cubans somewhere in LA as opposed to what I consider Miami's hegemony <laughs> mm. on Cuban identity and Cuban stories in general. So thank you so much. Um, I have no problem with Rita Moreno <laughs> uh, as a Cuban. By the way, I think she does an amazing <laughs> job. Um, and Cubans and Puerto Ricans are so close anyway. Um, who can tell the difference? So thank you. Thank you. Gosh, that's nice. Thank you. Um, hi, um, I have a comment and a question follow up. I know we've been talking about stereotyping the Latinos and I think it's important to talk about this negative rhetoric that exists under some stereotyping of some population of people of color, especially in California because we're still very segregated. Uh, but also I would like to bring the issue of representation because we have stereotyping, but the reason why we have this stereotyping is we it's because a reason. Uh, I'm an educated woman from the hood and I would like to see myself represented instead to be erased because I think it's important to still have representation on the certain communities in the minorities because it's important to uh, humanize them instead to erase them because it's an experience that is not being told but instead it's like um, I often see the representation of the perfect Latina, the Latina that made it because he's hard worker, the Latina that is educated, the light-skinned Latina that could make it because she's pretty. 
But I think it's important to know erase the experience of the people that doesn't have all those privilege or has a life experience because honestly, we live in a patriarchy, capitalist, imperialist, white society, white supremacy society. <laughs> So some of us cannot make it because of reason. Some of us, we can make it because we hold privileges. But I think it's important to not erase the experience of the people that is in disadvantage on the of media. Of course. Have you seen One Day at a Time? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, you have? Or Jane? <laughs> yeah. Or okay. Issa's High. Yeah. I think that's yeah. One easy yeah. These are, I don't think these are aspirational <laughs> stories. I think these are stories of people struggling. And uh, and are trying to make it when you know the whole reason Penelope goes into the military is because she doesn't have enough money to go to college to be a doctor, which is what she wants. So uh, and certainly the the I know from from sitting where I'm sitting, my privileges as a Latina. I know that my parents were able to come here, and I was able to get educated, and I was able to you know do that, and that is important, um, so that I can hopefully raise awareness about other stories and lift other people up. So that's, an, I, think, I think education is also really important. And that doesn't mean going to a fancy college. I think that means educating yourself in what you want to do in the industry. Like I said, it really can be the library, no joke. And it can be applying to the many wonderful diversity programs that exist in Los Angeles. CBS, ABC, NBC have great programs that you can write and you can get. The thing about being a writer and actors, please write. Because the thing about being a writer is you can do it. At, you can wake up and do it every day. Nothing prevents you from writing. Yeah. As an actor, as a director, you need the content. You need, the, yeah. you need that. But as a writer, you don't. You can write yourself out of something. And there's something so empowering about that. And so if you have a story to tell, it sounds like you do. You're so passionate. You're so articulate. My god, I'd love to see what you have to say, what that show is. I'd watch. I could stay here all day, but I think okay. we only have time for maybe one question or maybe two. Make it good ones, please. <laughs> They're all good. Hi, first of all, uh, thank you guys very much. Um, my name is David and I'm from El Paso, Texas. And we're producers uh, that are here for the American film market in Santa Monica. Uh, we have several projects that are very authentic, very good Hispanic stories being from the, being from the border. And, um, <clears throat> and we're here just pitching the heck out of our yeah, stories. good for you. Good for That's you. what you need yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, we're we're um, we're we've found such a thirst for this content, and uh, we've gotten great reception, and we're just trying to do what we need to do to to get there and get these stories out. So thank you guys for for leading the uh, the way, and um, you know we look forward to to seeing it, and maybe hopefully you guys can give us a hand somehow with. <laughs> Getting some of this stuff out, um, and uh, this is I'm David, this is Kevin, and this is Carlos. I thank you three very influential women that have helped the Latino community out so much, and not just the Latino side, but also the woman side. You know, one of the things I want to um, ask you and, and ask a very very fun and, and deep question is, we always talk about the very year that's you know been keeping Latinos and and everybody uh, South American whatever it covers as far as Latinos always been keeping us out of it. But now we see, for example, we'll give a little you know, information, but Coco was a project that has been started since 2013. It didn't go out because it was called Dia de los Muertos. But now it's, you know, they just released it in Mexico and it's the next big thing over there. Everybody's loving it. So it's a barrier that now we're seeing, you know, Coco, we're seeing you guys' uh, shows, we're seeing everything come to light and it's amazing. I see all of that, and we always talk about the barriers that we see and, uh, and the limitations that we have as Latinos, Latino women, but now we're seeing the boom of it in reality. Now we're seeing the, the, the openness of it. 50 million Latinos that don't get any representation, nothing whatsoever. We see the bad side of it. We see the, the negativity of it, but now we're really seeing the culture of it, the loveliness. And my question to you is how do you guys perceive this? How do you guys see this? Coming from El Paso, I mean, or from the border, we, we see this in and out. We see both uh, cultures mixed, the American 
and the Mexican, and it means a lot to really see this coming through. I mean, in essence, we just want to know how you guys are seeing this. How you women are seeing this, how you women are seeing this right? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that you see that this is uh, changing and that there's things there, but I don't, I, I think there's so much to do <laughs> yet. I mean, uh, there is representation, but in, I mean, if you think about the, the whole, it's just so tiny. It's, there's so much to do still. I mean, there's openness, of course, but we I think there's a lot to do still. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, no, there's mm -hmm. definitely still a lot to do. I think, I too, I mean, I'm a glass half full kind of lady, so I think that's what keeps me waking up in the morning. Yeah. Uh, I think I would, if I sat under the weight of the terribleness, I wouldn't be able to function. So I have to look at the positivity, and I do feel like suddenly there does seem to be a wave of people understanding how awesome we are. <laughs> L really. They're like, oh, you guys are kind of awesome. Where you guys been? You guys are awesome. I, I honestly feel like all of a sudden, they're like, oh, you guys are cool. And so I'm going to be like, uh-huh. Everybody, well, let's get in here. We are very cool. Get in here. So that's where I'm at. So I'm like, all right. Yeah, we are cool. I mean, like, listen, I'm exhausted and I have two kids. The last thing I wanted to do was go out with another show this year. But I felt like I have a responsibility to all of you and to, to so many other people to this show is hot. I don't know what's going to happen next year with this show, but we're getting the best reviews any sitcom has gotten in a decade. I need to use that, and I need to try to sell something else. And that is why I sold this next show, honestly, because I didn't need to do it. It's plenty of money. I can, I can pay my bills, which is all I want. I don't need a big fancy house. I want to be able to pay my bills and send my kids to school. I can do that. The reason I sold this other property was because I felt like I have to do more. Yeah. So... You know, that's, that's what we're all trying to do, and, and hopefully we will continue doing it. All right. Um, I want to thank you, wonderful women, for being here and thank for sharing you, your Bonham. stories. Thank you. Thank you, Bindi. And, and I also want to thank all of you, because one of the things that keeps coming up is the idea of education. We were all learning today, hearing these different experiences. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's one of the things, as a professor who is also a high school teacher, it, there, there really is the opportunity to tell your stories. But there's also a need to understand, and now I'm going to get in my political high horse, that public education is under assault right now. And if you don't know how to write a sentence, you can't write your story. So I, I think it's really important that these stories have been written, and I think it's really important that those of you out there who are students or are teachers know that it's all of our responsibility for the people to have the tools to tell these important stories. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.